let's talk about the airway. Inhalation is an active process. Your muscles are engaged, they're contracting, pulling out your thoracic cavity, making it bigger. That diaphragm pulls down, creating that negative pressure. So that negative pressure is basically just like a medical syringe. As that plunger pulls down, it's gonna be pulling that air down in. So with those muscles activated, diaphragm moves down, your intercostal muscles are contracting, open up that thoracic cavity to increase the volume you can store air. Where exhalation is more of a passive process. All those muscles relax, the diaphragm goes back up to its normal curvature, and that air releases. So again, that diaphragm, just like if you're holding that syringe upside down, as you can pull that plunger, as that diaphragm come down, it's gonna be pulling air in. And a lot of people always talk about the reason why it's harder to breathe at higher elevations. So what do you think? Is it due to oxygen? Really, your oxygen deficiency isn't going to increase until you're several thousand feet in the air, much higher than there's normal uh, inhabitants. These are people who are, you know, mountain climbers. Once you get up there, you're having to wear a supplemental oxygen to be able to breathe. But no, it's harder to breathe at higher elevations because of the atmospheric pressure. So if you think about a lot of athletes, while they go to high elevations like Colorado Springs to do training, it's to go and strengthen up all those active process muscles, your diaphragm, building up your lungs and those intercostal muscles. Because at sea level, where you've got a lot of outside atmospheric pressure, when that diaphragm goes to pull down to create that negative pressure, you've basically got a whole CPAP machine outside of you forcing air in. So it's easier to take that breath in. Where at those high elevations, you've got this really thin, much lower pressure so if you're sitting there trying to take a breath in, there's not as much outside force to shove that air in because respirations are all about the uh, equalization of forces going from higher concentration to the lower. So let's throw out a good even number. So if the outside atmospheric air is 750, as you go and create that negative pressure inside your body, you've created that negative pressure. So then inside might be 700. So 750 on the outside is going to go in towards that 700 quite easily. Well, if you're at a higher elevation where your atmospheric pressure may only be 500, that's a lot less force. It's you know, nearly a third less of the force to be able to push that pressure down inside into your thoracic cavity. And for all the perfusion, all the oxygenation, really the whole process of why we breathe in and out, for all that to take place, you've got to have a few things in place. One of the biggest, most important factors is those red blood cells. You've got to have that hemoglobin for the oxygen to be able to adhere to. Then you have to have enough adequate supply of oxygen to be able to adhere to those red blood cells. So at those high elevations, you know, Mount Rainier, those big mountains and people going climbing who need that supplemental oxygen, you're getting up those high elevations and you're getting below that normal 21% atmospheric oxygen. So you're going to need that extra oxygen to support those red blood cells. And those red blood cells must be able to take, uh, take on the oxygen and offload the CO2. So uh, some conditions that can affect that is CO poisoning, as we all know. That CO has nearly 400 greater times affinity to bind to that CO. So it really likes those CO molecules and they pretty much just beat up the O2 molecules and don't let them adhere onto the red blood cells. And you must also have good blood pressure. That's Sterling's law. The force going in is the force going out. So if you don't have good systemic volume or good pressure, it's not going to be able to circulate those cells so you can breathe fast and there'll be a bunch of oxygen in those lungs waiting for the blood cells to come through because there's bad blood pressure, bad perfusion to circulate all this stuff into the alveoli. At the alveoli, you've got a couple different forms of respiration. Externally, you've got the gas exchange between the alveoli and the blood, whereas internal is the gas exchange between the blood and the cells. The way I always like to describe it is that alveoli is just kind of like a boat dock. So as the oxygen comes into that boat dock, it's waiting for the boat to come in. So here comes in the barge hauling a bunch of CO2. That's the waste products of all the perfusion that just happened. So CO2 comes in, 
it dumps off a CO2, O2 hops on the barge and it makes another round to do its deliveries. And we've always been told that the avioli are these grape-like sack clusters. So in my younger days, which wasn't too long ago, always thought that those grape-like sack clusters were actually like the size of grapes. But on average, the normal body has approximately, the adult body has approximately 300 million avioli. So these are microscopic things happening here. With your respirations, there's two forms of respiration called. One is aerobic respiration, the other anaerobic respiration. Big difference between the two is whether there is presence of oxygen or not. So with aerobic respiration, oxygen is present. You have a good adequate supply of oxygen. So with your oxygen, good levels of glucose, the Krebs cycle goes to work and produces high levels of ATP. So that ATP is what our body needs for uh, its main source of energy. So with that ATP, normal Krebs cycle, lots of energy production, how we should all be functioning. And without that, uh, or with that, there's going to be just a little bit of waste of CO2 and water. So, you know, we exhale the, out the CO2 and then we urinate out the water. So thinking about that, if you have a patient who's hypoxic, are they going to have much levels of energy? Or you got that hypoglycemic patient. So you take out any one of those factors in Krebs cycle, they're not going to produce that ATP. Now with anaerobic respiration, oxygen is not present or there's just not efficient amount of oxygen. A lot less energy. So the body's going out looking for sources of energy where it doesn't have an oxygen to metabolize everything. So it's out looking and searching out and just causing mayhem within the body. So it's gonna produce a lot of lactic acid making that body very acidotic. The medulla located in your brain stem neurologically controls all your needs for baseline ventilation. The medulla is also known as the The medulla oblongata. Your primary means of regulation of breathing, the main a uh, sensor that sends that signal to medulla oblongata of how to breathe are coming from the chemoreceptors in the body. So from central and peripheral receptors, their main job is to measure the amounts of CO2 in the body. Whereas a lot of people think your primary means of wanting to breathe is from oxygen, it's actually depending on the levels of carbon dioxide within your body. So it's measuring out that pH level that's within your blood. Uh, so it's trying to preserve out that acid-base balance. So if you even think about your DKA patients who are acidotic, they're hyperventilating because they're trying to maintain and balance out their pH balance. And again, our secondary drive for regulation breathing is from hypoxia or the levels of oxygen. With the respirations ventilations, there are some really important terms and concepts to, that need to be understood. First is tidal volume. Tidal volume is the amount of air that's taken in in one breath. So depending on which research you read, which book, whatever, your average tidal volume is about 750 for the average size adult. But the anatomic dead space, what that is, is the, all the parts of your pulmonary system from your nose to your bronchioles that aren't doing anything about respiration. So they're not doing anything with gas exchanges. So there's just air going into those hallways and they're not really doing anything except just occupying the space. And that all kind of ties into the Bohr equation. So basically what the Bohr equation means is if you don't have, um, it's the difference between your tidal volume and the anatomic dead space. So if your anatomic dead space is greater than a tidal volume, there's no air getting to your alveoli. So it's just that direct effect that you got to have a good level of tidal volume to overcome and to be greater than anatomic dead space. So the difference between your tidal volume and your anatomic dead space is how much volume actually gets into your alveoli for gas exchange and cellular respiration. So that tidal volume has a great effect on that. So think about if you're trying to ventilate that patient and you're not getting them appropriate amounts of ventilation, that air, you may not give uh, provide them enough volume to get to their alveoli or, or perfuse or oxygenate all their alveoli. And with physiological dead space, that's pretty much just all uh, your anatomic dead space and 
the uh, the space to where it's getting uh, ventilated but poorly perfused. Or is that VQ mismatch, that ventilation perfusion mismatch? So what kind of example do you think that would be? Possibly like a pulmonary embolism to where there's ventilation going on but there's just no perfusion getting to where it needs to be. Now with the understanding of what tidal volume is, one of the biggest things you need to calculate for use of a vent is the minute volume or otherwise known as your minute ventilation. So basically this minute ventilation is for homeostasis of the amount of volume over a single minute that the body needs. Okay, so to calculate that minute ventilation, that is 120 milliliters times their ideal body weight. And referencing the ideal body weight depends on if it's male or female. So for males, 50 plus 2.3 times their height over 60 inches. So if they're 72 inches, that would be 2.3 times 12 plus 50. Because you gotta remember those order of operations. So a common practice for that is to take their height in inches, subtract 60, and just multiply by 2. And the reason that's a common place is because if you get an odd number that's single digits, when you go to adjust the ventilator, you're only allowed certain increments depending on the manufacturer of the ventilator. So that may be in increments of 10 or 20 anyways. So there's a little bit of tweaking on the numbers. So multiplying by 2 is a field commonplace acceptance. Okay, so you're going to take 120 times that ideal body weight that you calculated out, and that's going to get you your total minute volume. The physiological norm of, uh, for what is norm, is 4 to 8 liters a minute. That would be anywhere from 4 to 8,000 milliliters per minute. So you take that tidal volume of 4 to 6 milliliters times your ideal body weight also. So that is how uh, part of that calculation into the minute volume is figuring out that tidal volume. The uh, at six milliliters is uh, a physiological norm depending on the body weight because the taller you are, the more your lungs expand, the more volume that they're going to take. It doesn't matter your actual mass, how fat you get. It just depends on your overall size and your gender. Any tidal volume that's over eight per milliliter or eight milliliters per kilogram can cause significant issues such as bear trauma and uh, several s numerous studies are out there indicating where tidal volumes over eight milliliters per kilogram definitely increase mortality exponentially so now let's do a practice so we're going to solve for tidal volume for an 80 kilogram patient and this 80 kilogram patient that's our ideal body weight so let's solve, and that's going to be 6 milliliters times the ideal body weight of 80. So their tidal volume would be 480 milliliters. Now think of that tidal volume that we just calculated of 480 milliliters. So think about when you're going to ventilating that patient, that you've got this great big bag valve mask, and the common place that you'll see a lot of people do is you'll take that bag with both hands, squeeze the entire bag empty. Okay, so how much air is in that bag? If you squeeze it in the bag in its entirety, how much air are you going to deliver? Well, it depends on the manufacturer. The common place, such as the Laird All, one that is pictured here, holds about 1,500 milliliters of air. So now think about all that. So you're taking this humongous bag, you're squeezing it completely, and you're delivering over 1500 milliliters of air. So all you're doing is you're completely over ventilating these patients if you squeeze that entire bag. They make them easier, they put a strap on it for convenience of the EMS provider or whichever kind of medical provider is using the bag. So think about that again. Average person, 80 kilos, needs a tidal volume of roughly 500 milliliters, you give them 1500, you're giving them three times the tidal volume they need. That's going to cause barotrauma, increased thoracic pressure, which is going to reduce cardiac output. So think about those overventilated lungs and what sits right in between those lungs, the heart. What kind of patients are we generally ventilating? Ones in cardiac arrest or near pending cardiac arrest. So we're going to reduce the cardiac output of these patients by over ventilating them.
causing gastric distension, barrier trauma, and just a whole cascade of other effects.